This is the second half of the EKG interpretation and cardiac auscultation review. To remind you, there will be five cases presented. Each will have a one-line history, an audio clip of the patient's cardiac auscultation, and an EKG. You will be first asked to supply a description of the auscultation, then a summation of the most important or relevant EKG finding, and finally a unifying diagnosis. These cases may be a little more tricky than the ones in the first half of the review. Case 6. A 46-year-old woman with progressive dyspnea for 6 months. Here is what is heard at the woman's apex. So what do you hear? Most of you probably hear the relatively high-pitched systolic murmur. What shape does it have? It's uniform or holosystolic. But is there anything else there besides the murmur? Listen again closely. you hear another sound thrown in? Here is the phonocardiogram. Here is S1 and S2. There is the holosystolic murmur. What is this extra sound? For people who are either musically inclined or very comfortable with physics, you might notice the wavelength of that extra sound is a little bit longer than S1 and S2. That corresponds to a lower pitch. What do you call a low-pitched extra sound that comes in early diastole, shortly after S2? That's an S3. Listen again. Now pause the video for a moment to take your time with the EKG. What does it show? It's a normal rate and normal sinus rhythm based on the equiphasic lead being lead 2 with a positive QRS complex in lead AVL. The axis is about negative 30 degrees. Intervals are normal. What about the P wave morphology? The two most important leads, or really the two only leads relevant for looking at P wave morphology, is 2 and V1. In 2, they look normal. But in V1, the negative component just barely exceeds one small box in area. And that is indicative of left atrial enlargement. How about QRS morphology? Despite the notching in 3 and AVF, the morphology is not particularly abnormal in the six frontal leads. However, the amplitude of the QRS complex in the six precordial leads is modestly elevated, consistent with yet another example of LVH although this example is less obvious than certainly the three examples in the previous half of the lecture. The unifying diagnosis here, this patient has mitral regurgitation with probable heart failure. Case 7, a 32-year-old woman with progressive lower extremity edema and dyspnea for four months. Her heart, as it sounds, at the left upper sternal border. There will definitely be respiratory variation in, in this example, so listen closely. This is a little subtle, so don't be disappointed if you do not hear it but her S2 is significantly louder than normal, even for listening at the upper sternal border. This is usually due to systemic hypertension with the aortic valve snapping closed very vigorously as soon as ventricular relaxation has started. However, if you focus on S2 during inspiration, when the aortic and pulmonic components are separated, you may be able to hear that the second component of S2, that is the pulmonic component, is the louder of the two. That is definitely not normal. Listen again. <laughs> 
Now her EKG. There are quite a number of abnormal findings here. First, the rate is a little fast. Using the 10 second rule, that is using the knowledge that a conventional EKG recording is 10 seconds long, we can count the number of beats across the tracing and multiply by six to get the beats per minute. In this case, that's 18 times six or 108. The rhythm is sinus. The QRS axis is quite unusual. The QRS complex is downgoing in lead one and upgoing in AVF, which means the axis is rightward deviated. With the most equiphasic lead being lead two, the axis is probably around positive 150. Regarding the morphology of the waveforms, starting with the P waves, the P waves in V1 are atypical in that instead of their usual biphasic appearance, they are monophasic with a single upright deflection that is around one small box in area. That's consistent with possible right atrial enlargement. The most notable single finding on this EKG, however, is of course the very prominent R wave in V1 with an almost inverse R wave progression. The combination of a right axis deviation, possible right atrial enlargement, and a very prominent R in V1 is highly suggestive of right ventricular hypertrophy. How do we now put together four months of edema and dyspnea, a loud P2 on auscultation, and RBH on EKG? This patient has pulmonary hypertension. We can't tell why without more information, but in a 32-year-old woman, the most likely etiologies are primary pulmonary hypertension, chronic thromboembolic disease, or some type of rheumatologic process such as scleroderma, lupus, or rheumatoid arthritis. Case 8. A 22-year-old man with no past medical history abruptly syncopized while mountain biking. This is best heard at the right upper sternal border and is made louder when the patient either performs a Valsalva maneuver or abruptly stands. How would you describe this murmur? It's a harsh, crescendo decrescendo, systolic murmur, and a particularly late peaking one. Listen again. We'll come back to the changes in position in a minute. What about the EKG? This is obviously profoundly abnormal. The rate, rhythm, and axis are all fine, but the QRS complexes are enormous, and there are ST depressions and T wave inversions in virtually every lead, with the exception of mild ST elevation in AVR and V1. I can imagine someone seeing the ST elevations and think this might be an acute MI, with the T-wave inversions elsewhere representing so-called reciprocal changes. However, the morphology of the ST elevations are concave upwards, which generally do not represent acute ischemia or infarction. Also, ST elevations are generally not indicative of infarction unless they occur in at least two contiguous leads, which AVR and V1 are not. Instead, this EKG is an example of profound LVH. A unifying diagnosis? While it would seem possible for severe AS to cause both that murmur and LVH, it would be exceptionally rare to see AS of this severity in someone so young. Instead, this is an example of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. This condition is a genetic disease of the myocardium, which results in severe thickening of portions of the LV without obvious cause. It is best known as a leading cause of sudden death in young athletes during competition, including Cameroonian football player uh, Mark Vivian Foe and American college basketball star Hank Gathers. Although acoustically hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and AS may have similar features, the classic way to distinguish them at the bedside is to listen to changes in the murmur when the patient either performs a Valsalva or abruptly stands from a seated or supine position, 
both of which quickly drop the LV preload. In patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the murmur usually increases in volume in response, while in patients with aortic stenosis, the murmur is either unchanged or decreases. Case 9. A 45-year-old man with hypertension who is on hydrochlorothiazide, atenolol, and lisinopril, who is presenting with acute kidney injury and this cardiac abnormality. What abnormality do you hear? This is a relatively obscure auscultation example that I have honestly altered uh, in order to bring out the abnormality which was previously very subtle. Here is the phonocardiogram that shows two successive cardiac cycles with S1 and S2 labeled. You can see that the amplitude or intensity of S1 varies quite a bit from one beat to the next. Listen again. What about the EKG? Starting with the rate, you should immediately realize the patient is quite bradycardic. If we count the number of beats across the 10 second EKG recording and multiply by six, we get a ventricular rate around 36 beats per minute. What rhythm are we dealing with? There seems to be more P waves than QRS complexes. The P waves themselves appear normal but there is no apparent relationship between them and the QRS complexes, and they so-called march out uh, straight through the QRS complexes without seeming to have any impact on them whatsoever. So we call this complete dissociation between the atria's electrical activity and that in the ventricles. The combination of sinus P waves, complete AV dissociation, and an overall bradycardic ventricular rate is indicative of complete heart block. The variable intensity of S1 is actually a direct consequence of the heart block, as the intensity of S1 is largely dependent upon the strength and velocity of mitral valve closure, which itself is dependent upon the relative pressures in the LA and LV at the onset of ventricular contraction. You can imagine that those relative pressures vary depending upon how soon after the atria contract that ventricular depolarization occurs. What's the diagnosis? That is, why does this particular patient have complete heart block? There are many potential explanations, but based on the single line history above, beta blocker toxicity is the most likely as atenolol is renally cleared and can build up to dangerous levels in the setting of renal failure. Case 10. A 56-year-old man with pancreatic cancer presents with shortness of breath for two hours. Take note of the changing sounds which are a consequence of the patient's own breathing. What do you hear? Most of the cardiac cycles occur during expiration when there is at least one and maybe two extra sounds. The easier to identify is the low pitched S3. The slightly harder to appreciate sound is the fact that S2, which should not be audibly split during expiration, actually is here. Then when the patient inspires, the lower intrathoracic pressure leads to increased RV preload and decreased LV preload, which has the effect of making A2 come slightly earlier and P2 slightly later.
so the S2, which was already abnormally split during expiration, becomes even more so during inspiration. The term used to describe this pattern is a wide S2, or widely split S2. Furthermore, it's a little unusual that the S3 is loudest over the lower left sternal border instead of the apex. Although the location of a heart murmur has only a fair amount of agreement with the actual location of the responsible valve, S3 and S4 tend to localize very well, such that um, usually when those S3 and S4s are caused by a problem with the left ventricle, they're usually loudest over the apex. Therefore, an S3 at the lower sternal border is suggestive of a rare right-sided S3. Take another listen. Now the EKG. The rate is normal, around 75 beats per minute. There is a one-to-one -one correlation between P waves and QRS complexes, and the P wave axis is normal, that is the P wave is upright in lead two and downgoing in AVR. How about the duration? Although the QRS duration may appear normal in some of the leads, such as V3, it should always be measured in the lead in which it appears the longest. In this case, it appears to be either V1 or V6. In both of those leads, the QRS duration is around 120 to 130 milliseconds, with the upper limit of normal being 120. I won't go through the details of the differential diagnosis of a prolonged QRS duration, but with a prominent RSR prime pattern in V1 and prolonged S waves in 1 AVL and V6, the etiology here is a right bundle branch block. The unifying diagnosis for acute shortness of breath, a widely split S2, a right-sided S3, and a right bundle branch block on EKG, a massive pulmonary embolism. The presence of the S3 is suggestive of right-sided heart failure, which could be followed by obstructive shock if not quickly addressed. That concludes this 10 case review of introductory EKG findings and cardiac auscultation. Please remember to like the video if you found it helpful, leave comments if you have questions or suggestions, and subscribe if you are interested in more medical videos.